This is Daybreak Asia. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. And Heidi, Korea, of course, shut today for a public holiday. But Japan really watching that quite closely, given that weaker yen helping to power or lift some of the exporters there. Yeah, how long does that last, right? Potentially, if we see more momentum from the Bank of Japan, the yen starts strengthening. Of course, we're going into earnings season. The guidance from Japanese companies could be conservative. And, Bell, we're starting to see, you know, a little bit more optimism and perhaps fund flows going back into China, too. Yeah, that's right. And actually, uh, Citibank out with a note saying that N Nikkei 225 could have lost a little bit of momentum given some of those risks that you addressed there, particularly from possibly a strengthening yen if we do see any sort of revision coming through, particularly in inflation forecasts. But uh, this is the outlook here we've got for Japanese equities. Uh, pretty much... Uh, flat to start the day, a little bit of weakness coming through, so not really tracking those moves that we had on Wall Street overnight. We saw a sort of late-day rebound for U.S. equities. Uh, certainly at this point in time, we're very much priced to perfection, so any sort of uh, surprises coming out of the U.S. inflation print, any sort of geopolitical risks that could appear on the horizon, that is something that could really dent uh, traders' risk appetite, even as we approach or ahead of the earnings season. So that's the state of play there for Japanese equities. Tracking that Japanese yen very closely here, 152 is seen as possibly the line for any sort of intervention. But whether we reach that point, of course, depends from that US inflation print. Are we likely to see the reading coming in stickier or hotter than expected? Let's uh, change on because Heidi, as we said, Korea is shut today, but Australia just starting to trade now. Yeah, this is a picture as we get, of course, that uh, staggered start to trading, a little bit of upside, about a tenth of 1% there. We're watching uh, some of the big miners, of course, as we see commodities really jumping and getting that lift uh, will be the bit beneficiaries that we've seen over the past sort of few trading sessions. Also, some of the big gold miners, iron, Eel, iron ore, I should say as well, uh, that supportive rally with uh, iron ore headed for that biggest two-day rally in more than two years, that brighter China consumption outlook uh, really boosting some of the sentiment across that part of the commodity sector. But taking a look more broadly, the Aussie dollar is trading at 66.29 uh, at the minute. We've seen kind of the dollar pretty much steadying ahead of the US CPI print uh, that is very much in focus. And we do have uh, a little bit more sort of uh, moves when it comes to trading around the Kiwi as well, of course, ahead of the RBNZ decision. We're not expecting a move or even much of a signal towards a pivot, but certainly some of those indicators suggesting that there could be quite a bit of hope in the markets um, that we see that pivot towards easing a little bit sooner from the RBNZ. When it comes to trading in the Kiwi, the Aussie Kiwi pair, Nomura exiting that position before the central bank decision, saying that they see the pair near their value and they're not actually confident that the RBNZ will be able to or will want to meet that dovish pricing that we see in markets at the moment. And finally, also watching, of course, crude, the other part of the commodity story. We're seeing just under $90 a barrel there, uh, up by about a tenth of 1% when it comes to Brent, but those two-day losses more or less being held by crude with that report pointing to a rise in U.S. inventories. Uh, and of course, we are watching Treasuries very, very closely bow ahead of the key CPI report. And we actually did see a bit of a rebound. Treasuries rising ahead uh, of that print and the bets uh, really against bonds are starting to kind of uh, a spike when it comes to the building expectations for what we see in that inflation print. Any inflation resurgence that's seen as perhaps hotter than expected across that second quarter period, we could see some, some of those sideline Treasury investors coming back into short positions. And again, that's back in yields, Bill. Yeah, let's get more on that. Bring in Daniel Lamb, Head of Equity Strategy at Standard Chartered Wealth Solutions. And Daniel, you're one of the, the people out there that's actually expecting inflation to come in hotter than expected. Somewhat hotter, yeah, because um, we believe that inflation is likely to be affected by the housing side of things, which is probably going to remain a bit stickier, given how strong the American economy is. And also now the energy is... Of course, the cost is costly, right? The crude oil being where it is. Mm -hmm. And so how does that affect your outlook then for, for rate cuts in turn? Well, we're still expecting three rate cuts, but now the line is probably shifting to two to three. Mm. And you've seen that beginning of the year went from, you know, the street is expecting six times. Now yeah. it's three and now it's two to three. And that has implications on how you allocate within the U.S. equities. Mm. Right, because in Q1 we've seen you know the growth sectors powering ahead, but 
you know, towards the end of Q1, you start to see some rotation to the other sectors, especially to U.S. energy. So therefore, you know, we as a house have uh, upweighted U.S. energy to an overweight. It's a short-term technical buy, uh, given the fact that the tight um, demand and supply dynamics of oil is helping crude to go higher. So that means that the upside earnings risk is, is you know, probable for U.S. energy companies in this earnings season. Then how does that sort of, that shifting allocation, how does that also change your, your allocations within Asia? Well, um, in Asia, basically we like Japan equities, um, but, you know, at this stage, like what you said, in Nikkei 225, is, you know, probably storing at, stalling at these kind of levels. Mm. So in terms of sector preferences, you probably need to tweak a little bit, right? You need to be going more for the domestics because, you know, there are concerns that, you know, what if um, the yen strengthens? Mm. Okay, what if the Fed doesn't want to cut as much as what people expect them to? What if the BOJ, looking at the inflation data, they may be looking at, you know, doing more faster hikes, mm. things like that. So yen strengthens, it's good for domestics. Daniel, what are your expectations going into earnings? Is there a risk of disappointment given how much optimism has been built up when it comes to Japan? Well, for Japan, we do see it as a long-term story, right? Because the wage growth is you know, certainly strong and the fact that BOJ exited the negative interest rate policy is a vote of confidence to the economy. So for the long term, it's looking good. But you know, for the short term, of course, it's run up by you know, quite a bit. And uh, expectations, like you said, is certainly high. And so is for the US markets, right? So you could see that there is some sh short term pullback in the sectors that have been running and, you know, likely rotation amongst the sectors within the uh, equities regions there. Daniel, where expectations has not been high is obviously China, but we are starting to see maybe just the, the, the start of a little bit more interest returning to that market. Would you be one of the people that think that there are more opportunities now and some optimism? Oh, well, a month ago when I was here, I was saying that China assets not looking too bad, and I still maintain that view, <laughs> um, especially for the state-owned enterprises, um, because, you know, the dividend yield is very high, and, of course, the government has made, you know, the management this KPI that they need to boost their market capitalization. So all these are very strong incentives um, for them to continue to outperform. And, you know, those are, you know, opportunities where we see in the China market, and we still continue to see that. Daniel, we are just getting uh, some of the comments from Bank of Japan Governor Ueda there talking about uh, the need to watch out for FX and its impact on inflation. He expects financial conditions to stay accommodative, that the financial system overall is resilient, underlying inflation trend to rise gradually and see, is still citing that there is a moderate economic recovery with some weakness still being seen in parts of Japan's economy. Uh, so we've talked a little bit about Japan in, in, in terms of just the market optimism that we've seen there. What are the sectors that you'll be looking at that are not sort of the lower hanging fruit, right, if the economic outlook remains pretty mixed and the BOJ is really not in any hurry to pick up momentum? Well, basically, it's very much about the yen, right? So if the US, if the Fed is starting a power back on their um, rate cut expectations, then the other side of the coin is the yen would be, you know, by definition, would be strengthening. So if the BOJ is not in any hurry to be hiking, then it would lessen the pressure for the yen to go higher. So, you know, in this case, I would still be concentrating upon the domestics, right? Because the economy, um, you know, is looking pretty good, right, versus the rest of the globe, most parts of the rest of the globe. So the domestic stocks like the, uh, the banks, um, you know, the insurers, okay, the consumption stories, those are the sectors that one would be looking for. Exporters, they're okay, right, but then you don't know when the yen 
you know, is going to be strengthening. If they do strengthen, then it would hurt the exporters. So for the short term, the market is looking fine, buying pullbacks. For the longer term, domestics, they probably have more room to run than the exporters. One asset class that hasn't really been perhaps moving in a way that investors might anticipate is gold. Uh And it's something that you track quite closely. At these sorts of levels, do you still think you want to be buying gold? Not here. But if it goes back to, say, 2200 or the 2100 level around those, then it will be looking interesting. Um, Right now, you know, there has been much demand from the Chinese investors Mm. right for gold because they're looking for alternative investments Mm. but uh, if you do see the chinese markets you know coming back in some sort of form you know then that could be you know lessening the upward pressure on gold a little bit right Mm -hmm. that side right daniel lamb that was uh, the head of uh, equity strategy rather at standard chartered wealth solutions and uh, we are just 10 minutes into the session so far for tokyo trading korea is shut today for a public holiday but some of the stocks we're watching in particular here is what we see for the chip makers. That's uh, not the last close price. That's actually the intraday price for these names. But uh, Microsoft is said to be investing almost $3 billion over the next two years to boost their AI capacity in the country. And so those names, of course, very much Heidi in the spotlight. And coming up, uh, we'll be hearing from the Texas why they think the Bank of Thailand should hold rates today, even with inflation staying low. We'll get more on their outlook later this hour. But first, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida beginning his Washington trip, urging U.S. businesses to boost tech investment in Japan. We'll get more on his agenda. This is Bloomberg. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida is making a pitch for American investment in his landmark visit to the U.S. Kishida met with business executives ahead of his one-on-one talks with President Biden. Our Tokyo Bureau Chief Isabel Reynolds joins us now for more. And this bilateral summit between Biden and Kishida is scheduled for overnight Asia time. So what specific outcomes are we expecting? And, you know, what are we expecting when it comes to uh, deals and investment and trade as well? Right. Well, as you've seen, we've already had that massive um, Microsoft investment announced in Japan, $2.9 billion. So that's um, obviously a huge success for Kishida to mark up um, on his score sheet for this visit. Uh, But as you say, the summit itself um, takes place overnight, our time. Um, What we're expecting is for the overarching theme to be concerns about China, to be concerns about showing how united um, the two countries are on this issue, um, to have the two militaries work more closely together, for example, to set up a defence council, which will um, work on looking at how procurement, uh, defence procurement between the two countries can be made more efficient. Um, And that could apply, for example, to things like Patriot missiles, which are produced in Japan, but very expensively. Um, And Japan has already agreed to pass on some of its Patriots to to the US. Um, But obviously, at the moment, that's a very expensive proposition. Um, In addition, there's something about um, having Japanese shipyard workers um, um, to repair uh, U.S. naval ships, for example, in Japan. So very much kind of knitting together the two sides um, in terms of the military and the alliance aspect. Now, going back to the business side of things, um, so there's a huge Microsoft deal. Oh, sorry, yes. Go ahead. No, I was going to ask, yes, exactly. Continue on the, the business side of things. Yes. Um, so apart from the Microsoft deal, um, we had uh, Kishida addressing these, this group, a large group of um, business executives earlier today in Washington. Um, one of the themes they talked about was LNG. Japan is concerned about how sustainable its supply of LNG will be from the US. Um, but obviously the big elephant in the room at the moment is the Nippon Steel deal. And I think the overarching message that Kishida wants to send is, hey, you know, Um, investment between our two countries is healthy, it's beneficial. There's really no need to fear a Japanese company taking over a US company at this stage. 
You know, the other elephant in the room and perhaps a pretext for this visit, right, is the risks posed by China. And there's the first trilateral summit with the Philippines. And there's the question which we posed to uh, Ambassador Rahm Emanuel earlier last hour. How do we expect Japan to, I guess, position itself within this situation in the South China Sea? Um, yeah, that, that's very much still to be seen. I mean, Japan has for a long time been, been kind of in a subtle way trying to build up its uh, defense ties with the Philippines. It's done things like um, passing on radio equipment and doing things like that. But it, it has been anxious also at the same time. Japan is its biggest trading partner still. Um, and it doesn't want to completely alienate its largest neighbor. So um, there's always going to be, I think, a fine balance for countries in this region. They can't afford to um, really cut off their ties with China, but they have to show China that they mean business when it comes to territorial issues. That was our Tokyo Bureau Chief there, Isabel Reynolds. And one of the issues, of course, that's been left off the official agenda between the two leaders is Nippon Steel's $14 billion takeover bid for U.S. Steel. The biggest U.S. Steel union has decided to do everything in its power to block the deal and has the backing of President Biden. That's the focus of today's Big Take. And let's bring in our commodities reporter, Martin Ritchie, for more. Uh, Martin, it's, it's rare to see unions holding so much sway in, in the world of takeover deals. But why has this one in particular become so complicated? Uh, it has become uh, extremely complicated. I think our story uh, re recently referred to it as a 14 billion firestorm. It's politics in, in every direction, really. Um, so in the face of it, this was a fairly simple, straightforward uh, transaction. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's be between two highly advanced uh, steelmakers, one in Japan and one in the US. They would combine, they would share technology. Nippon Steel, the Japanese company, had yes. promised uh, not to make any cuts, not to make any layoffs, to invest one billion in, in new facilities. Um, but the big problem is politics. Uh, this is a, it's a big year uh, with the elections um, coming up. Um, the unions are, are very powerful in the U.S. Uh, steel industry uh, and still in U.S. steel. Um, they want to make absolutely sure uh, that Nippon Steel is going to protect their members, uh, not just jobs, but uh, you know retirement plans, uh, all benefits. And they want to make sure that um, Nippon Steel is going to keep some of the facilities um, that have sort of been under pressure over recent years uh, in in certain key states and. One of them is Pennsylvania, a very key swing state. Um, now, Biden has come out and said uh, he doesn't want U.S. steel uh, owned by a foreign company. Uh, that's the position now. There's a lot of to and fro between the unions uh, and, the, and Nippon Steel. There's also a potential rival bid from another U.S. company for U.S. steel. So this has become uh, just a, 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 a really complex situation in the middle of a in the middle of an election year. And it is in the middle of an election year, right? Realistically, can the deal go ahead despite President Biden's intervention, despite the domestic political noise? Look, I have to say, when I first uh, saw that, you know, what, what Biden had said, I, I thought, well, that deal's, that, that deal's dead. But it does seem like the reporting mm. coming out from the US uh, is saying, you know, it's, it's, it's rather just kicking the can a little bit down the road beyond the election. Um, uh, a lot of people seem to be suggesting that this deal can go ahead in some form. Um, perhaps the Nippon Steel deal, I mean, there's three possible outcomes, right? Uh, Nippon Steel um, can possibly uh, get this to go ahead, maybe after a lot of uh, legal uh, work. Uh, secondly, this rival takeover bid can go ahead, but there's, there's uh, complications there as well. That would create a really powerful domestic um, U.S. steel company owning 100% of U.S. iron ore production. U.S. car makers wouldn't like that. Uh, and, and thirdly, the deal might just, might just fall apart. So um, it does look like this is going to be an issue for 2025, though, uh, post-election and post uh, once we see whether it's Biden or Trump in the, in, in the White House and they return to it. And Martin, as we were saying, this is one of the items that's been left off the official agenda, at least with uh, President Biden and Kashida meeting. But uh, what are the implications, really? What sort of signal does this send? And could it be something that ends up being problematic for, for relations between Washington and Tokyo? 
Um, I think uh, our, our colleague uh, who was on just before me referred to this as the elephant in the room um, for, these, for this meeting between Kishida and, and Biden. Um, look, I, I, I do think uh, they, they will try and just uh, set this aside. Uh, possibly on the Japanese uh, side, they understand uh, why this is complicated uh, in an election year for Biden. They, they probably understand why he's, he's come out and said this. Um, but it, 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 it does look strange when, uh, you know, Japan and the US are supposed to be very close allies, but yet you have uh, a deal involving one of Japan's, you know, best known, best companies referred to the National Security Board for further investigation. You know, that, that, that's obviously going to be a problem and Kishida might, might, might raise that, but it's, it's, one, it's one part of a much bigger picture for Japan-US relations. So I don't think it's going to be, a, be a, it's not going to derail the relationship. Our commodities reporter Martin Ritchie and you can read the full story on today's Big Take on the terminal or head over to Bloomberg.com. More to come here on Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg. Taking a look at how commodities are faring so far this morning, you've got Brent crude, WTI, both of those are fairly range-bound so far. We actually saw a little bit of weakness creeping through in the price session, uh, given that we had an oil inventory report coming out showing rising U.S. stockpiles. Uh, OPEC and IEA, they're also scheduled to release their market reports this week, so that'll give us a better sense on the sort of supply-demand pressures that we're likely to see over the course of the rest of this year. But uh, Iron ore, of course, one to track. It has really been on a bit of a tear over the course of this week. Uh, that is uh, given optimism starting to come through around China's demand outlook. So you're getting back a little bit closer to that 110 level, uh, given we were below that $100 a tonne mark just a few days ago. Gold to track as well, given we saw it hitting a fresh record high overnight. Uh, we were just speaking as well with Daniel Lamb from Standard Chartered Wealth Solutions saying at these levels, you do not want to be buying in. But we have seen, of course, a lot of buying coming through from China in particular. And uh, let's stick with China for the latest geopolitical developments that we're tracking here because Beijing and Russia say they've agreed to start a dialogue on Eurasian security with the aim of double counteracting the European Atlantic Alliance that's led by the US. Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov told a news conference in Beijing that the two nations would begin a dialogue and seek other like-minded countries to join. Beijing and Moscow have intensified their partnership since the invasion of Ukraine. China is sending its highest level delegation to North Korea in nearly five years. The third ranking member of the Politburo, Zhao Lerji, will lead the three-day trip starting Thursday. China's long been North Korea's biggest benefactor, but the US says Kim Jong-un's regime is now receiving massive amounts of aid from Russia in exchange for transfers of weapons for the war on Ukraine. Another story, Bell, that we're following. A source says at least three people have been killed after an explosion at a hydropower plant in northern Italy. Enel's renewables arm, Enel Green Power, says the fire impacted a transformer at the plant but did not provide details on casualties. The company shut the plant down immediately for safety reasons, but local power supply was not affected. Take a look at how European futures are opening this morning. We are seeing a little bit of caution, of course, as we get closer and closer to the release of that key U.S. inflation and print. Uh, we have really seen a little bit of weakness in the previous session for European stocks, but potentially a bit more optimism in this session. Euro stocks 50 futures are by just about four tenths of a percent. We're also seeing a positive open for German DAX futures as well. The Tuesday session was marked by uh, European stocks falling as uh, these doubts over how many rate cuts we could see from the Fed and caution before that inflation print really curbing risk sentiment more broadly across global markets. We are also watching, of course, any moves that we see in the dollar and how that uh, trades following that inflation print. Coming up next, the outlook for emerging market economies with Natixas. They're turning more bullish on China's recovery. This is Bloomberg.
Bloomberg opinion columnist Mohamed El Arian expects a Fed will ease monetary policy less than its peers in the coming months. He told us that the central bank has doubled down on its wait and see approach and needs further evidence that inflation is slowing. I think Chair Powell has made it very clear that he's willing to look through these bumps. To use his phrase, the inflation story hasn't changed. So they will need overwhelming evidence that it is more than a bump in order for them to change their views. You think they're too sensitive to recent data and maybe not being strategic enough. What do you mean by that? So I think if you look forward, and, and you talked about in the last hour about business confidence, if you look forward, there's reasons to believe that this economy may slow. So if you are setting policy not according to what has happened, but according to the lags with which the policy operate, you would be more dovish than you would be otherwise. If, however, you focus exclusively on the data, you will end up being too hawkish. You talk about small business uh, optimism. Let's go there. It came in at the lowest level since December of 2012. Sometimes it's hard to know how to read some of these gauges, especially because we get people on all the time saying they're all broken. How important is this in contrast with all of the bullishness and the momo and the fomo and the wo that we keep hearing? This is really important. The big mistake that was made in 2021 when people embrace the transitory narrative was they didn't listen to the companies. And the companies were clearly saying, we have inflationary pressures in the pipeline, we have pricing power, we're gonna pass on that imported inflation, if you like, that was coming in. This time around, listen to the earnings call. And they are worried about the outlook for the rest of the year. So, so I do think you need to listen to them because often the aggregate data doesn't capture what businesses are feeling on the ground. All right, that was our Bloomberg opinion columnist Mohamed El Arian there speaking with our colleagues Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramovich. Uh, quick check on how markets are trading so far, keeping an eye, of course, on what Treasury is doing in particular. We saw that sort of retreat coming through for, for yields overnight, but certainly it is that big focus on the U.S. inflation print. And is it going to come in hotter than expected? What is that going to mean for the outlook for Fed cuts over the course of this year? We're down to around two to three being priced in at this point in time. Uh, stocks in Asia, so we're half an hour into the trading session so far for Japan and Australia. Korea is shut today for a public holiday, but we are just seeing a little bit of caution prevailing so far. That is the last trade that you're seeing there for the Kospi. As I said, it is shut today for a public holiday. Uh, but uh, no real relevant economic data on the schedule, except really that positioning we're seeing ahead of the U.S. inflation print. And actually, if you bring up this terminal chart, EM stocks in particular, uh, we have been tracking that, that rise, and they're actually now trading at their highest level since June of 2022. Yesterday, the rally was really helped along by the big jump that we saw in TSMC hitting a fresh record high uh, given U.S. government investment. But still, we have seen risk appetite broadly for emerging markets helped by the recent data that we're getting from, from the U.S. in particular, signaling that recession risks are easing and the lack of new flare-ups perhaps in the Middle East. But let's bring in Trin Nguyen now, our Asia Emerging Markets Economist at Natixis. And Trin, what does that sort of rally signal to you and how could that really be tested by the U.S. inflation print if it does come in hotter than expected? There are two key drivers for emerging Asia. One is the U.S. economy, which is hotter than expected, by, according to data, which is very positive because we export from Asia to the U.S. So with demand higher, that's great for TSMC in terms of the chip cycle. It's great for Samsung. It's great for Korea. It's great for Vietnam. It's great for China. So the data in Asia for exports are improving. Now, the only issue is that this red hot data is fueling inflation and inflation is not good for financial conditions because higher rates for the U.S. puts a lot of pressure on particular particularly low yielders in Asia. So if you look at the inflation tonight, markets are pricing a, 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 an acceleration. So there, there is a deceleration into you zoom out in trend. But the fact is, there's a lot of fear because of the components of the ISMs are showing different direction, direction right? Manufacturing mm -hmm. is uh, price pays accelerating, but services are lower. So therefore, looking ahead, I think this is going to be a big driver for EM Asia because the FX side of the equation doesn't like it as much as equities, right? As mm -hmm. I mentioned, there's a bifurcation in asset performance. Equities like strong growth. FX doesn't like it, particularly low yielder, particularly the bot, particularly the yen, particularly um, the Korean won. We want inflation to slow so that the Fed, at the very minimum, has inflation as a point to cut. And right now, we still don't have that. 
And so then how is that sort of move then likely to impact the thinking of those those central banks and those currencies that are particularly sensitive to what happens? Well, the Thai baht is the worst emerging Asian currency year to date. Well, the yen is worse. But when you talk to EM Asia, why is that the case? The baht is actually quite low yielding. Even if inflation is very low, nominal yield matters. On top of that, we have the prime minister putting a lot of pressure on the Bank of Thailand, which today is going to hold rate, um, according to opinion, but actually the PM before said it's go, it should cut and so on and so forth. That pressure, um, I think, is, is feel, felt very acutely because it's not in a position to hike to follow the Fed. So the Fed needs a cut to lower that, that wide gap between the bot and the dollar. And that puts pressure on portfolio flows as well. So, so for low yielders, it's particularly uh, quite important. Because high effort, high, weaker domestic effects actually push through uh, to pass through to uh, inflation, so that's a negative impact. And a lot, another ap- aspect is financial conditions tightening um, with risk aversion, right? So, so, so for Thailand, that, that's a negative, and I think that's a key of air concern for Korea. It's a, an air concern too for the BOK when it looks at it, because inflation is still not on target in order to cut. And so a weaker FX actually puts more pressure. Mm-hmm. On top of that, we have commodity prices tearing, right? Um, mm-hmm. You have fuel and we have food accelerating. And that's a factor to watch as well. Mm-hmm. Trin, you see a cyclical recovery for China. Mm-hmm. How strong is that recovery when you have some serious structural and demographic issues at play in the medium and longer term? Um, well, we really like the ICT cycle upturn, right? Um, one thing to look at is that exports were actually quite underwhelming in 2023. And in 2024, we have the cyclical recovery, which we expected and is happening. And that will continue to, to happen. The second aspect is that China is normalizing, right? Um, let's not forget, about a year ago, it was still uh, really just opening from zero COVID. So now we're normalizing for services and as consumption is recovering quite strongly. Investment is lagging, but consumption is. And now that, I think, is going to help with the cyclical recovery. If you look at an aggregate headline level, GDP is decelerating, but you know it's still going to throw a lot into the table by growing 4.8 ish, 5%, right? So China is not growing that badly, and I think that is a factor that's going to not just support domestic growth, but also the rest of Asia. Look at Thailand tourism, right? An aspect that's weak is really um, on the portfolio side, but on the positive side, on the current account side, China normalizing is pushing up the current account. U.S. doing well is pushing up the current account via exports for export traders and also on tourism. Thailand, um, February number recovered to pre-COVID level. And we think that's a trend that's going to happen. Malaysia as well. Um, And and that's very supportive for these countries moving ahead. How big is the geopolitical risk, right? particularly if there is a change in the U.S. presidency, the U.S. government after November, the pressure over overcapacity, the pressure over uh, de-risking, decoupling on the tech side? Do you think that's going to have a meaningful impact on China's growth trajectory? Um, I think a lot of that is quite, um, uh, you know, that's something that we now think as a baseline scenario, right? Um, the, the competitive strategic competition between the U.S. and China is a, 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 a something that, that's, that's considered as a baseline, and I, I don't think it's going to get better. It's just being sheltered at the moment. Um, and the second aspect is, I would say, is that China is very careful about this. If you look at the way they look at the yuan, even though it's weakened against the U.S., it's not deterring um, that much. It's actually... Um, Uh, on the top end year to date. So China is being quite concerned about what the, you know, everyone's talking about in terms of how it's going to export this deflationary pressure to the rest of the world and the fact that it's focused so much on industrial policy and does produce much more than domestic demand, right? Um, so, so, so I think it's going to be managed quite carefully. Geopolitical risk is a concern for China and is a point of benefit for the rest of the ASEAN countries. If you look at a country that's not being talked about a lot is Malaysia. Malaysia FDI inflows have, have been quite strong in semiconductor, uh, uh, you know, and it's actually driven not just by South Korean firms, Japanese firms, American firms investing in semiconductor to really um, decouple and um, to, 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 uh, to, to, reach, to, to, to hedge the risk, but also particularly Chinese firms, right? And so we will look at when we look at this as a baseline, we also consider that Chinese investors themselves will want to hedge this risk, and some of that will be hedged. Um, so as a result, we, we, we feel a lot 
level of concern. But at the same time, this is being uh, a hedge at the moment via the supply chains. And there will be winners um, um, that we were seeing right now. And I think Malaysia is one of them. So is Vietnam. And so is Thailand um, for to, to, to reshuffle some of some the risk within China. Who are the sorts of winners? And you've touched on commodity prices already, but who are the sorts of winners and, and losers if we see commodity prices continue to rally? I mean, we've been talking about perhaps $100 oil by, by the end of this year. A country that's quite weak, um, in my opinion, is the Philippines. It has a double deficit of fuel and food, right? The Philippines imports rice, the Philippines imports fuel. Now, that's a key concern, even though as a share of GDP, fuel import is not as large as, say, um, Korea or, or, or Thailand. It has a uh, uh, um, it has a concern in that if it both happens at once, inflation can accelerate and puts a lot of pressure on the capital account. And that actually already happened, right? Particularly in a higher inflationary environment, countries like India or, or Thailand, who are net food exporters, will have protectionist measure by banning export. And that makes it much more vulnerable because it has levers, less levers to pull. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, because it hasn't fiscally consolidated its fiscal space as much as other countries and doesn't have as much buffer, it also doesn't have a lot of space to also hand out subsidies to temper some of this, meaning the government absorbing some of the costs from the households and so on and so forth. So we're quite concerned when you see accelerating food and fuel inflation. Um, everyone in, in Asia, except for Malaysia to, and, of course, um, Australia, um, don't really benefit from this, right? Um, so, so we are concerned, but the degree of concern vary. Mm. All right, Trin, thanks for your time. That was Trin Nguyen there, Asia Emerging Markets Economist at Natixis. And you can get a roundup of the stories you need to know to get your day going in today's edition of Daybreak. Bloomberg subscribers go to DayBigo on their terminals. It's also available on mobile in the Bloomberg Anywhere app. You can customize your settings so you only get the news on the industries and the assets that you care about. More ahead, this is Bloomberg. Let's get more on uh, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida's agenda in Washington. This is the first state visit by a Japanese leader in almost a decade. The U.S. Ambassador to Japan, Rahm Emanuel, spoke to us earlier from the White House lawn and told us that he has high expectations. This comes at a historic moment for both countries as they change dramatically their kind of deterrence uh, posture and position. Japan's changed in the last two years five separate policies that have been basically on the books for 70 years from the size of the defense budget, the counter-strike capability in the defense area, normalizing and level, really bringing the level of relationship with the ROK, the Republic of Korea, to a new, more solid strategic level. The United States also has made some fundamental changes going from a hub-and-spoke system to a lattice uh, multinational type of strategic architecture. And I kind of see this state visit, the fourth from a uh, head of state in the region out of five that the president's done, is kind of putting a period at the end of one era that's defined as alliance protection and beginning to write the first chapter of the new era of alliance projection with uh, Japan. And that's not just for the Indo-Pacific, but also as a key strategic partner in a global set of issues. The second thing, it's kind of uh, bookend the week started with Australia, the United States, Japan, and the Philippines doing naval and uh, air exercises together in a new multinational uh, effort, and have the ends of uh, the week with a historic first ever trilateral between the United States, Japan, and the Philippines head of state. That reflects and symbolizes the change in the United States approach. It also symbolizes the uh, kind of role that Japan's going to play as the constant in our air in our relationships in the area, but it also symbolizes. China's whole strategy is to isolate the Philippines, isolate Australia with their economic coercion, isolate Japan by not accepting uh, their fish to be exported. Our strategy is to flip that script and make the isolated party China. They're the ones that are uh, isolated in the South China Sea as it relates to the Philippines. They're the ones that are isolated when it comes to trying to uh, use economic coercion to coerce Australia to change their posture. And they become the isolated party, which is why they throw in the towel on that effort. So that's how this uh, state visit, it's 
been a long, it's been uh, nine years since the last Japanese pre uh, prime minister has had a visit, but it comes at a critical juncture where the relationship will pivot into a new kind of posture and a new position. I wanted to hone in, Ambassador, you've mentioned, of course, the first trilat summit with the Philippines. How far do you expect Japan to involve itself when it comes to these confrontations in the South China Sea, where, of course, these encounters tend to be more aggressive than what we see in the East China Sea? Well, the whole goal is not to have a conflict. That's what credible deterrence is. And understanding that this is not China versus the Philippines. This is China trying to uh, coerce the Philippines into changing their policy on which the international court in 2016 ruled was in favor of the Philippines, not China. And understanding that China needs to understand that the Philippines has some very, very important friends in the neighborhood, the United States, Japan, and Australia in this situation. That was the U.S. Ambassador to Japan, Rahm Emanuel, speaking to us earlier. And you can watch us live and see our past interviews on our interactive TV function, TV Go. There you can also dive into any of the securities or Bloomberg functions we talk about, plus become part of the conversation by sending us instant messages during our shows. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Check it out at TV Go. Boeing shares fell to their lowest in five months after the New York Times reported the Federal Aviation Administration is investigating complaints about safety issues. They say a Boeing employee who worked at the firm's 787 Dreamliner aircraft alleged that sections of its fuselage were improperly fastened together. Meanwhile, the plane maker handed over 83 jets for the first quarter, logging its lowest deliveries for the period since mid-2021. The majority of those planes were 737 MAX jets. Well, Mazda's CEO says the car maker is watching global supply chain issues caused in part by battery shortages and increasing exports from China. Masahiro Moro told us those challenges have only grown after last month's Baltimore bridge collapse. At the moment, uh, our operation team has been closely working with the port of Baltimore and a concerned entity to find out uh, port points uh, nearby for in inbound vessels. And also we are working for, you know, alternative uh, ports uh, we have in the East Coast, Jacksonville, temporarily to minimize the uh, delay of delivery to the customer. So that is the current outlook and uh, we're looking forward to come back to the uh, port of Baltimore once the operation is back on track. So that's dealing with the finished product, the delivery of those products. As far as making your cars here, are you dealing with any supply chain constraints, the getting supplies and things? Uh, we do have a supply chain issue uh, uh, globally. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a few reasons behind it. Uh, one is the uh, vessel shortages. Um, during pandemic, vessel companies scrapped the old vessels and they are nearly invent to more uh, LNG based, uh, you know, uh, better fuel efficiency and low CO2 vessels. That is one reason. The second reason is uh, just uh, mentioned Suez Canal and, and the Panama Canal uh, uh, is uh, unable to pass through. And the third reason is the significant increase in the export from China mainland. Mm -hmm. now those are contributing to a significant challenge for you know, logistics right now. I, I am curious. I'm glad you brought up China. Most of what they're exporting, though, are they, those are primarily EVs, or, or are they direct competitors to the models that Mazda is producing? It is a combination between battery, pure battery EV mm -hmm. and the range extender and the internal combustion mm -hmm. engine. It depends on the brand of, or Chinese brand. Mm -hmm. What car do you think will sell the most? EVs, hybrids, or ICEs in the next, say, five years? Uh, I believe still internal combustion engine has really? strong support from the consumers. Mm -hmm. uh, and secondly, I see a great potential in hybrid. Mm -hmm. That is a perfect solution. Uh, for customers, uh, there is no uh, anxiety for range. Uh, right now, it's getting uh, traction right now. 
That was the Mazda CEO Masahiro Moro there and some other corporate stories that we're tracking today. Intel is going to be rolling out a new version of its AI chip in the third quarter in a bid to compete with NVIDIA. The Gaudi 3 processor focuses on helping to train AI systems and running the finished software. CEO Pat Gelsinger says the chip will cost less than NVIDIA's current and future processors. Meta is downplaying the threat of AI disinformation in a big election year. At an event on Tuesday, its top leaders say they haven't seen that happen yet on their services. Last week, Meta announced plans to label all AI-generated content on Facebook and its other properties. Experts fear such media could mislead voters or spread disinformation online. And surging interest in AI stocks has triggered an unprecedented $50 billion ETF boom in Taiwan. For more, let's bring in Taiwan Markets reporter Betty Ho. And Betty, it's a very interesting market because Taiwan, what makes it so interesting is how retail-driven ETF investing is in the country. So it's just all about optimism and and perhaps FOMO around uh, AI. That's right. So we are seeing an unprecedented um, ETF frenzy here in Taiwan. And a lot of it is driven by, you know, just this investor's love and optimism for artificial intelligence. And um, so the, ty- the, 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 the hype of that is, has already um, helped the Taiwan's benchmark stock index to um, reach several record highs this year and, um, and also um, helped the TSMC, the largest chip maker in Taiwan, to to also break several record highs. And we we now know that so investors now they're buying these ETFs because on top of the you know the the good dividends that it's promised to pay, they also hope to you know benefit from the price gains um, amid this stock rally. Are there any concerns for regulators here? Yeah, so regulators have um, already addressed several concerns that they have, and one of it is how the fund houses that issue ETFs uh, do their marketing campaigns with online influencers. So online influencers, they're really popular right now, and they go online, they make YouTube videos, and they, they go on Facebook and talk about investing in ETFs, and that's... Um, that's also making the frenzy even even harder. Um, the central bank governor came out and said that he thinks investors are acting like sheep, basically jumping into this market one after another. And the financial regulator in Taiwan right now is conducting a um, financial inspection on the firms that issue ETFs to make sure that they are not violating any rules. Markets reporter Betty Ho there in Taipei. Coming up in the next hour, BNP Paribas Asset Management joining us uh, to talk about what it will take for China's economy and Chinese markets to recover. We also get analysis on US-China relations with the East China Normal University ahead of that trilateral summit with Japan and the Philippines in Washington. That is it for Daybreak Asia. The China Show is next.